I'm Rachel. And I'm Dan. And we're coming at you from Bay Ridge, talking about the most exciting race on the November ticket. It's, well... Exciting is a relative word for Bay Ridge. We've got the mayor race, city council race. Mayor is arguably more interesting. Mally Tox is all over the map, high on Red Bull, chasing down de Blasio, <laughs> but... For instance, on education, forget hot lunch. Which de Blasio made happen, free universal school lunches. Does not get enough credit for that. No, um, not. So, Maliotakis, uh, she wants to put retired armed law enforcement officers in every school. Quote, it's to deter incidents that have occurred over the last few years in which there have been threats to schools. It's what she said to the New York Post. Of course, the Post. Mm -hmm. In New York City, our last school shooting was in 2002, Nicole. Our last shooting death was in 1992. We just had our first school killing in 25 years on the 27th. And according to ABC News, the police said it was a result of a weeks-long beef between the three kids involved. The school says the weapon used would have been picked up by... An ex-law enforcement officer? Metal detectors. Oh. The majority of school shootings are also suicides. Kids feel oppressed, marginalized, bullied, troubled. I was at that age. And putting more guns around them is the answer? How about actually getting them some help? How about having enough staff on hand to observe and relate to kids so they can spot this stuff before it happens? How about adding some more metal detectors if we're really worried about making parents and kids feel better? She told the New York Post her goal was to ease kids' and parents' minds. Well, how does that work when Nicole, I don't believe in sanctuary cities, Maliotakis, puts armed ex-NYPD in city schools? Will they be empowered to send tips to ICE if they suspect a parent or child is undocumented? Ugh. How will these guards be screened? I didn't even think of the ice thing. Well, and here's another thing. First, she said they wouldn't go in the school. Then she said they would go in the school. So she doesn't even know if these are in the school or outside the school <sighs> guarding people. I wonder how she plans to prevent police misconduct. But not even cameras can prevent police misconduct. I mean, look at Eric Garner. Civilians board said it was an illegal chokehold. No consequences. And it was caught on camera. It's almost as if cameras don't prevent crime, Rachel. Which brings us to... <laughs> our Bay Ridge City Council race and our council men currently, Vincent Gentili, who's term limited out of office. After a pretty intense primary Very on both intense. the Dem and GOP sides, mm -hmm. we have Justin Brennan former president of the Bay Ridge Democrats, and John Quaglione, who till very recently worked with State Senator Marty Golden's office for 20 years. But the Brooklyn Eagle says he's on a leave of absence. Well, he's on his leave of absence from his first job and only job. At least he's got it to go back to. Speaking of Golden, Golden's office is reported as the primary factor for holding up NYPD surveillance cameras that are aimed to halt things like drag racing, speeding, traffic violations. For Let's put a pin in golden for now, figuratively. Figuratively. Quaglione is the Republican on the ticket, and he was endorsed by police unions in the primaries. We'll see what happens in the general. I don't think we're going to be surprised. And so he had to have some kind of flagship security proposal. Otherwise, it's like nothing makes sense anymore. This is why he's proposing this program. It's called... Eyes on the Street, it is a surveillance program. I'll let Quaglione explain his idea in this clip from YouTube. And we believe that if we create a database system where if a homeowner first priority makes a report to the local police station, either the 68 or the 62, if they make the report to the precinct, they will then be able to, if they have a camera, and many of us have cameras on our homes now, we're in a business, if you have a cam video of the footage, we're, we're, we're calling for the establishment of a database where you can upload the video to the NYPD official site. Hopefully it would be broken down either by neighborhood or police precinct. And then anyone in that area that is experiencing or has experienced a similar crime, anyone else that has had graffiti written on their garage door, anyone else that's had their car broken into, anyone else that's had their FedEx or their UPS package stolen from their front porch. They would be able to log on to the system and look and see, and this will help to get the word out and allow the people to play more of a role in finding the perpetrators. So here's the thing. Quaglone is talking about a crowdsourced video content platform that gives the NYPD the ability to see, catalog, and keep 
anything anybody submits to them would be in this database. As long as it comes with a filed police report. He wants this to be accessible also to regular citizens, not just trained members of the NYPD. While working for Marty Golden, Quaglione got a lot of videos from constituents who had had their Amazon packages stolen. They were mostly by one guy. Red what, van guy. Red van guy. Guy <laughs> driving the red van. Who they did not catch. No, they did not catch Red Van Guy. Even though he was on video, Red Van did. I apologize for that. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> He was caught on camera, so how effective are cameras? It's almost as if cameras don't prevent crime or really do much to help catch petty criminals afterwards. And actually, there is a clip about how this proposal grows out of feelings more than hard numbers. Again, go to the clip. Definitely, you definitely make a report. We've had probably 10 to 15 people have this problem with, between throughout the council district. And the first thing I say to them, did you make a report? And, and of course, you need, you need the police to know that in the 80s or in the 70s or near 13th Avenue or near 15th Avenue, that's where, that's where these bad guys are, are hanging out and, and uh, going shopping and we want to grab them. That's what we're fearing here in, in New York City. It's on the mind of, of many New Yorkers. If you read the stories, even though the crime numbers are, are overall still very low at all time low records, the feeling of people's feeling of being unsafe has increased substantially. So that is coupled with you come out of your house and you find your car broken into. You come out of your house and you see graffiti on your, your doorstep or on your deli, your deli store where you buy your bagel in the morning. Or, or you, you come home from work and you get the email that says your, your diapers.com order was delivered or your, your Christmas gifts were delivered and you come home and they're not there. So that creates a feeling of insecurity in the neighborhood. So I like to... The icing on the cake here, and you heard it, he admits this isn't actually a huge problem. It's about people feeling insecure. You know, for all the left gets accused of being snowflakes, this is the second feelings argument we've talked about so far in regards to policy from Republican candidates. Okay, there might have been more thefts than just the 15 that reported it to uh, John, but the victims of those probably actually called UPS or Amazon, or maybe they actually went through the trouble of looking up their local precinct and calling them during business hours to file a report like you're supposed to do in a nation of laws, <laughs> instead of passive aggressively posting to social media because you think the reporting system of the NYPD is too convoluted, I guess? And... If they let Amazon know, they probably just got a free reshipment of their item, which is generally what Amazon does. And he said it himself, this particular rash of thefts affected like 10 or 15 people this year, but it made them feel insecure about their neighborhood. A lot of times, not even people who've actually had anything happen to mm. them, but have just heard that a neighbor yeah. on social media had had something happen to yeah. them. It's, it's a weird echo chamber. And depending on what statistics you look at, crime is actually down in Bay Ridge. Even more if you look at the city as a whole, and we'll put that data in the show notes because we know that's controversial for some people. Yeah. So when you look at this problem, you know, things getting stolen and people not feeling safe, the biggest crack in this that I'm seeing is that people aren't reporting these petty crimes to the police. To me, that says you try to go get more people to file reports, not that you build a whole new boondoggle of bureaucratic bullshit to take the place of human intervention. Quagleone kind of, in that video, goes really hard and says, please, 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 please report. Yeah, which I've heard from both sides. So please, 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 if you are the victim of having your Amazon package stolen, report it to the police. But at the same time, Quagleone is proposing this eyes on the street surveillance program. So he wants to make it easy for you to social media share the videos to the NYPD and also all of your fellow neighbors. We think. I'm not sure if suggesting a massive surveillance database and it will have to be massive mm -hmm. is really the right way of going around this. How about tech supported police filing? I text my thing, the police get it. We're good. Yeah, you don't, and you also don't need to share it amongst your local neighbors on an NYPD database. Like we already have social media for that, yeah. and it's stupid when you do it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, I can go to a Bay Ridge neighbors group and share it, and guess what? My neighbors will see it. Actually, this is probably a good place to say, if it isn't already really clear, 
Dan and I both have some major reservations about this proposal, including... That it would encourage vigilantism. That it raises questions about data security, privacy, false reports, and could lead to our communities being less safe. And that any legislation of this sort would need to include significant protections, probably more than it's worth for packages getting stolen, mm. regarding police oversight and further eroding of our Fourth Amendment rights that the chances of surveillance preventing or reducing crime are slim. And that's what Jane Jacobs' vision of how eyes on the street was supposed to protect a community and make it safer. And this in no way, shape, or form is reflected in this proposal. And side note, we already have a program in New York City aimed to make our neighborhoods safer through more community interaction with the NYPD. It's called Neighborhood Policing. It sounds awesome. Go on their website. You can see them talking about it, about interacting with the neighborhood. More of that, please. You ever heard about the beat cop? We need the beat cop. Community policing is the beat cop. It's mm -hmm. resurged again under Bill de Blasio, like mm -hmm. hot lunches, something you don't get much credit for when you're trying to deploy it. And mm -hmm. Bay Ridge needs it to be deployed to our neighborhood. It's already being deployed elsewhere. Yep. Instead of a surveillance database, maybe we just need that. That would be, it would be great if our city council people were able to make that happen in this neighborhood. So I actually reached out and emailed John's office and said like, hey, I'd like to have some kind of information about this. And he was willing to call and have a conversation. Cool. When we were speaking, he was very clear. We're not talking about streaming 24-7 surveillance from your home webcam. To the cops. <laughs> yeah, he's talking about an incident-based system where you file a report and you hand your information over to the police and they can put that clip online or you can upload it and they can put it online. Once you put in the police yeah. report, you get a key to access like Something. this. But you have to file the police report. So let's remember everybody, file your police reports. Yes. So let's just say that I've seen Red Van Guy. I know who he is. Mm -hmm. And I see him walking down Third Avenue. And it looks a lot like him. And he's walking toward me. Same hat, same hoodie, whatever. What do I do? Do I call 911? Do I look up my precinct and make a report? We, We've already agreed. That's not happening. I aim my phone camera at him. I follow him while taping. I try to figure out what building he goes back into. I blast a pick out, tag the NYPD on Twitter, and I probably tag John and Justin. Yep. And then I run over, tackle him, and place him under citizen's arrest. Is this what I do? What if you've got the wrong person, Dan? Yeah, this is the problem with vigilantism. We're not all Batman. We don't have we a mega... try to be Batman. <laughs> and this is the thing, Quaglone shouldn't be giving us the bat computer <laughs> to try to figure out how to be him. Just throw out the bat signal and get the cops in. <laughs> yeah, the, let's, let's trust Commissioner Gordon on this. <laughs> I file a police report. I turn in my video. Just might not feel good to just you're do You're not it ratting there. anybody out to the entire internet. Yeah, I'm not getting any like feedback from my neighbors saying, oh, that guy's a jerk. I feel so bad that you got your package stolen. That's not even talking about people who aren't quite right. Um, or, you know, they don't like the look of somebody. You got to ask, when does see something, say something, be responsible for being the human behind the eyes on the street? Where does that turn into pitting neighbors against one another? And does Bay Ridge really need that kind of a divisive plan? Plus, like, look at how Reddit mis-ID'd the Boston bomber. Somebody's life got ruined. And you've got Sean King, who's been blasting out photos of Charlottesville white supremacists, and it's led to a couple of arrests. Okay, great. But it's literally his job. And he enlisted thousands of other people via his mailing list to make that happen on social media. And he was sharing photos of actual Nazis committing actual violent crimes. And it's still taking weeks. I'm not sure if someone swiping my local delivery of cabbages off mm -hmm. my doorstep from Fresh Direct is really warranting the same kind of thing as much as we'd want to feel it should. I don't want to feel it should. <laughs> I don't think it does. And then there's the question of data security privacy, false reports, and a community that's actually going to be less safe. So data-wise, just looking at things like the Equifax breach or reports of election hacking in multiple states back in November, links in the show notes, like this stuff happens. Brianna Wu is running for Congress. She's a technologist. Um, she was one of the women targeted by Gamergate. Her slogan is she fought the alt-right and won. Awesome, <laughs> oh, right? Um, but she's really clear that the federal government doesn't have what it takes to securely protect our data and that private companies aren't being held accountable. Um, and a little closer to home, I had a conversation with our congressman, Dan Donovan, about a month ago. Really? Yeah. In person? He actually uh, sat down with It you. was a constituent meeting. He's very committed to those. Um, 
And we touched on cybersecurity in the course of the conversation, and he was really clear there are very real concerns about terrorism and cybersecurity affecting every part of American life right up to things like the utility grids and airplane safety. So we would need assurances that this database is going to be 100% hack proof. If anybody gives you that assurance, they're lying. <sighs> yeah. I'm not sure how secure the NYPD already is, but opening up this kind of thing for public perusal mm -hmm. would be a weak link in their chain. So then there's the police reports. This is supposedly the entry point into this system. These police reports that aren't being filed. Why aren't you filing them? File <laughs> police reports. Yeah. yeah. When the police report gets filed, that's supposedly the thing that secures this whole network. Like, what criminal is going to file a police report? Mm. You'd think that that would be a good way of securing this video. Okay. So they're going to get the video, screen the video, make sure it's not Bob's revenge porn before they upload it to the city and get shared with everybody else. Or that it isn't some nosy jerk with a webcam trained on a specific specific target to try to catch him doing something nefarious, neighbors mm. harassing neighbors. Speaking of, if you look at some of the information that came out when Edward Snowden leaked all that information on the NSA, it was clear that those people were abusing their access to the data that the NSA was collecting. They were listening on their exes, they were accessing information they shouldn't have, that kind of stuff. People abuse power. I don't think you can count on the idea of this information staying secure. Even if all we were talking about was the human element. And the footage itself, you can get a lot of data off a camera image if the person taking the image doesn't know what they're doing. Truth. And I'm not just talking about what's in the image. A lot of people put up these webcams because they think it's easy, it's like mm -hmm. Nest, they just drop it in. People can get the make and model of your camera from just looking at that image. There's metadata that can also be pulled that has to be scrubbed and I'm not sure if I trust them to scrub it. Just the way that the numbers flash mm -hmm. on the image. Yep. And a lot of these people are taking cell phone footage of their surveillance cameras. Oh like God. you can see like the desktop in the background oh sometimes. God. Like they're not like exporting the video. Why? I mean, we're data people. We yeah. know that you don't Sorry. do that. You're just Sorry. taking no judgment. It's, it's easy to take a cell phone video of your computer screen, but there's a lot of stuff you can get off that. And if you're sharing this, if I wanted to like steal someone's package, mm -hmm. I would file a police report that my package got stolen. Mm -hmm. I'm the, I'm the thief. Okay. I can file a police report. Like, you yeah. can be a criminal and file a police yeah. report. Criminals Even someone with priors. Like, crime to pawn. Yeah, so I can, like, submit something and get access to this huge database. And if I know what I'm doing, and a lot of thieves know a lot more about surveillance than people who put them up in their homes, mm -hmm. figure out what the make and model is, look up what the default password is for that mm. camera, shut it off remotely. If you have a standard Netgear router in your house, they can just get into that, get into the webcam, mm -hmm. and you provided them with that data, the angle, and they can see in the video exactly what the range of motion is, what the camera angle is, and go right around that or know exactly how low to tip their hat so mm -hmm. that their face isn't in the image. And the thing is, like, if as a country we need to worry that terrorists might take our grid down or take down planes with a laptop, and again, those points were both made by Congressman Donovan in a constituent meeting I had with him, then we also need to worry that bad actors might, you know, look something up on the internet and hack your camera. And speaking of bad actors, <laughs> all that information it creates a buffet for criminals, for snoopers, for identity thieves, sure. Let's centralize it all and make it hackable. <laughs> yeah, that's a great idea. It's a legitimate target for real hackers, not just people who are looking to steal your package. People who might benefit from learning about your cameras, use it as a backdoor, and get into your real stuff, your real private security yeah. stuff. Yeah, and by the way, like, not to freak anybody out, but this is not tinfoil hat shit. Like, this is the world we live in. These things have and will continue to happen. And the only conceivable way of protecting that data is by assigning highly trained, well-paid, extremely trusted details of officers to scrub, sort, and anonymize the data that gets turned over before it uploads. By the way, Facebook does kind of anonymize this kind of stuff, but if you're just directly uploading it to the NYPD, oh. they're going to have to create the infrastructure right. that already exists to keep this kind of stuff secure. And I'm not sure we want our local police department, one, being in charge of that, and two, getting the funding that would be necessary to do that. Mm. All that stuff you're talking about, that takes ages. Yeah, and talk about racking up overtime for scrubbing that kind of stuff. 
Speaking of overtime, who are the cops that get to sit around picking through this information? You might have heard this word before, not, not in this order. Um, rubber gun rooms. Yeah, rubber gun rooms. It's, it's a term that's a reference to the Department of Education's rubber rooms, where disciplined but unfireable staff keep pulling a wage for menial work. And we also have that for a lot of other municipal agencies, hmm. including the NYPD. And they're called rubber gun rooms or rubber gun squads. They're staffed by members of the NYPD who are on modified duty. Why, who gets put on modified <laughs> duty, Dan? Daniel Pantaleo, whose use of a chokehold led to the death of Eric Gardner in Staten Island. And what specifically do rubber cops do? They monitor surveillance footage, like those of the absurdly named Viper Squad. Video, interactive, patrol, enhancement, response. Yeah, that was named backwards. They just no. liked... <laughs> no, I don't believe it. But the they Viper monitor housing squad, project videos. Yeah, they monitor the housing projects. The so they stick a bunch of people in a room to basically go through the housing project video. And these are people who the NYPD doesn't even trust enough to have a direct line to report crimes they see on these videos. Know what they have to do if they see of a crime on these housing project videos? They're encouraged to call 911. Jeez. The Viper Squad has, like you might think, a terrible history with this kind of thing. Tell us about their terrible history oh, with this kind gosh. of thing, Dan. There was a murder in a housing project that the Viper Squad was supposed to be monitoring. Mm -hmm. I don't know what happened in terms of catching the crook. That's not the point here. The point is that that video that mm -hmm. came from public surveillance that only could have been monitored by the Viper Squad. And that video that actually showed the murder. Yeah, it's a snuff film level shit got onto a porn website, uploaded to a porn website Ooh. by someone who could only have been a police oh, officer. Squad. Yeah, yeah that, that's, that's really okay. messed up. And during the RNC protests, um, what, when was the... 2004? There was a helicopter flying over that was supposed to be monitoring the... It was like uh, a bike ride in the East Village, maybe yeah. something. The video camera of trained NYPD officers mm -hmm. moved over to a rooftop mm -hmm. where two people were having sex. Oh boy. And it stayed there for minutes before panning back. And the video wasn't even deleted. And that it guy's stayed. not even in the rubber gun room. No. These are trained NYPD officers, and maybe they won't give this job for webcam video to those kind of cops. Maybe. maybe they'll give it to the precincts that you live in. But then how does that information get managed and shared across precincts within the city? You've got to have a centralized, you know, something doing it. I have well, not heard Quagleon say that this is how it's going to be. I don't know if he knows that these are the kind of people that probably would be tapped to do it. When we look at all of the other programs where something like this happens, those are the people who end up doing it. So you have to be explicit if they're not going to be the ones doing it. The benefit of bringing this stuff up before the election is the candidates have a chance to like go back, look at what they're thinking, reassess. Maybe they can reach out to communities, offer to do town halls. Maybe they can convince people that this is a good idea if this is what they think or if they have an alternative. There is space for collaboration in governing. And, you know, everybody agrees. We all want safer neighborhoods. We all want fewer crimes. Let's get together and talk about how you make that work for everybody, not just how you make it work for the people getting their Amazon packages stolen. All right. So let's look at how this would actually be done, how this legislation would really go. Any legislation that would establish this kind of surveillance database, it would need to include significant protections regarding police oversight to avoid further eroding our Fourth Amendment rights. As the Arab American community in Bay Ridge is well aware, slight tangent, shout out to um, Quagleon's pal Marty Golden, our oh, state yeah? senator, who focused attention on Bay Ridge after 9-11 by making up lies about the community harboring terrorists. Wow. Shame on him. Anyway... Post 9-11, a lot of law enforcement attention was focused on our Arab American community, with few, if any, restrictions placed on those surveillance powers. And what powers are those? I mean, stingrays. Yeah. <laughs> they capture cell phone yeah. data x-ray vans that can drive along kind of if you've ever seen breaking bad there's like they put a huge magnet in a truck it's like oh, this right. huge thing they can drive this van and surveil the interior of what? buildings they can look through walls without warrant we don't know that's the scary part this is yeah. operational guidelines that the mypd says they have but aren't public we don't know what 
means they can call in a stingray or what means they can right. call in an, an x-way truck and i feel like we have the right to know that yeah and this is what actual surveillance law looks like it, the post act public oversight of police technology act it's currently in city council it would force the nypd to disclose its operating procedures for these sorts of things it isn't law yet it seems like it's going to deal with more kind of activities that they undertake for terrorism investigations. I wonder if Quaglion supports it. Well, I mean, we spoke about this on the phone call I mentioned the other day, um, and I'll give him credit. Like, when I asked about his feelings on the Post Act, he went, he Googled it, he looked it up, he read about it, you know, it took a couple minutes, and then we talked about it. He didn't like the ideas of these x-ray vans. He didn't like the idea of heat search technology being used for warrantless searches. I'm not sure that he and I agree on where the line for Fourth Amendment protections gets drawn. We didn't get into that. But my takeaway was that at least he appreciated that this is a concern our community has and it's legitimate and that you have to be careful about who gets caught in these surveillance nets. I would like to know more about how he would proactively improve police department oversight because that seems like a prerequisite for anything mm -hmm. else that he's going to talk about in terms of surveillance. Mm -hmm. I'd like to know more about what he as a city council member might be able to do to strengthen New Yorkers shot to hell Fourth Amendment rights. And the same goes for Brandon on both counts. 100%. And while we're writing our wish list, I'd also like to hear more about how we could raise starting base pay for NYPD cops. I saw a few different numbers, but pretty much every source put it between 40 and 45K a year, which For is insane. Really? 40 and 45K? Yeah. That's barely more than I made as an admin assistant 10 years ago. And I stood an effectively 0% chance of getting hurt on the job. The mm. NYPD pays their cops less than Macy's pays their starting copywriters <sighs> fresh out of school. You know, higher pay attracts high quality candidates. It lets good cops know they're valued and supported. Let's spend our money on the kinds of solutions that raise the quality of life for everyone in Bay Ridge. And if you're going to go against teachers being in rubber rooms, mm -hmm. let's also be critical of the police unions that yeah. keep the cops there. Let's be fair across the board. Mm -hmm. So now we've hit the question, does electronic surveillance prevent crime? Because ultimately, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to drive petty larceny numbers down and make people feel safe in their homes by uploading video footage. The answer is no. Cameras don't prevent crime. The, the vast majority of research, and we'll link it in the show notes again, I know it seems counterintuitive, but this is data coming out of heavily surveilled cities like London, downtown Manhattan. They show no correlation between increased camera presence and prevention. Yes. Cameras can help catch people when the resolution is good. And again, most webcams do not have great resolution. Mm -mm. They help show the unfolding of events to clarify a crime. A person stealing your package knows they might be on camera. Most criminals know they might be on camera. It, they're like 20 mm. bucks now. You can't be off camera if you're below Canal Street, I remember reading. I'm looking at my phone. I'm technically on camera right now. Did you see what the red van guy did? What did Red Man Guy do? He wore a hat. A hat. A hat. A hat. A hat. Right. And, I mean, I appreciate people might feel unsafe because their Amazon package got stolen, but when you look at the real risk presented by that scenario, I don't know that that's where we focus our money. I mean, real talk here. Earlier this year, a woman in our community was brutally assaulted in her apartment. Like, ended up with an extended hospital stay assaulted. Her building had cameras. They caught the guy. After the fact. Some idiot let a stranger into her building. They caught that on camera too. It was a human failure. The only preventative solution would have been for that idiot not to let a stranger in the building in the first place. And even after that, like a lot of the other people in her building wanted to add more security cameras, mm -hmm. even though at the end of the day, they had them and they didn't stop this assault. More aware citizens... More neighbors who knew who the other people in their building were because they interacted once in a while and, you know, they give a shit about each other's safety. That might have helped. Mm. It's really weird. I don't think just from a, a fiscal responsibility point of view, and I'm, I'm a dyed in the wool progressive liberal and I'm talking about how much money this is going to cost. <laughs> we are going to have to spend a ton of money to overcome a $10 hat. And I'm mm. not sure it's a great return on investment. I'm sure that it's not a great return on investment. <laughs> And here's the thing. We've touched it on it already. Quagland is calling this eyes on the street. This is an academic point. Um, it's a blatant misappropriation of a term originated by the mother of all urban theorists, Jane Jacobs. I hope 
our listeners know who Jane Jacobs is. If not, Google is your friend. This term is specifically intended to emphasize community empowerment and engagement as a way of securing our cities and reducing crime. Sounds kind of like that neighborhood policing thing I mentioned earlier, but getting back to academics are important. Mm, yes, and they are. you've got the architecture and urban planning background. Go for it. So, eyes on the street. This is why we need it more than ever and why webcams are actually the death of it. Mm -hmm. Eyes on the street are literal eyes on the street. And a webcam isn't an eye. It's an Orwellian eye, to be sure, but it's not an actual human eye. We need more people to just hang out on their front stoop. Mm -hmm. More people yeah. who don't retreat into the back of their mm -hmm. house. A lot of times you see people moving their bedrooms in their houses to the mm -hmm. backyard side because it's quieter. They don't right, like right. noises and things like that. Well, guess what? Those noises are sometimes things that you really should wake up and peek your head out mm -hmm. the window at. Yeah. The Kitty Genovese case. I don't mean to belittle it, but there was a well, lot of it, false reporting on it. I was going to say it wasn't accurately reported from what I understand. No. Uh, they were saying that there were a whole ton of witnesses and no one called the cops. Number right. one, a bunch of people called the cops. Mm. And two, all of those many witnesses, most of them never saw the full crime happen. Well, and there are even questions about the number of witnesses. If you look, it may be that that was the number of apartments or the number of people in apartments. So we're not even sure how many people the police actually interviewed. Yeah. So if you don't know the Kitty Genovese case, it was a woman who was stabbed and killed right on the front of her apartment complex. Up in and Forest Hills? Yeah. yeah. And this was one of the big things that said, oh my gosh, people see crime, but they don't report it. Mm. No, Everyone assumes that someone else is going to report it. And... Credit to it, the story made people much more willing and likely to report crimes because all of a sudden they had this story in the back of their head that mm. I shouldn't assume that anyone else is going to call. I better right. call. The thing is, is that people do call. And the reason people did is that there were eyes on the street. Mm -hmm. People were listening. People, yeah. even with their TV, were hanging out and there's all the in insulting stereotypes mm -hmm. in the neighborhood of like oh the old guy in the neighborhood who just goes oh, out right, with a hose right. and washes his stoop every morning like why do you need to water the sidewalk <laughs> right, dude right. but that guy's providing an essential service yeah. he's there he's... he knows what's normal he knows what's not normal side stores mm -hmm. side and bars things that mm -hmm. a lot of people don't like in the neighborhood like oh i don't want this barber shop on a residential street around the corner mm. from like fifth or fourth or 13th i don't want this store there because it's interrupting my nice bucolic residential right, street right. the kids hanging out in front of that barber shop People think that they're the crime. They're the drug dealers. Guess what? They are not. A lot of times, mm -hmm. those are the people that discourage that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Those are the people who know what's going on. And if they were to report something to the police, have a long-standing history of what goes on on that corner. Mm -hmm. Actually, can I interrupt really quickly? I was watching a video last night on the NYPD website about this neighborhood policing idea. Yes. And one of the things that really came into that, and you can go on their website. We'll link in the show notes. You can watch the video. Um, these cops are talking about how they get to know the store owners, they get to know the kids, they get to, you know, have however long it is that they're not on call and they're just walking around the neighborhood getting to know people. And in this video, there's two cops who, there was a, an armed robbery and the cops found out about it and they watched, they did watch the security footage when it was reported. And because they knew the people who were recording it and they trusted yep, them. Yep. <laughs> and they watched it and they said they were driving around and they saw this guy from the video walking down the street and they got out and as they started to follow him, he tried to pull a gun on them. Um, and ultimately they were able to take him down and arrest him with nobody getting hurt. And they said in the video, part of the reason that nobody got hurt was they knew everybody in the neighborhood. Everybody knew what was going on. Like those are important things. Yeah. Sorry. And, but Kwai Leung's the other only person I'm hearing that's saying we need to go further and deputize neighbors. And I don't think that that's a good idea. You mentioned yeah. that the guy was armed. We shouldn't be asking our neighbors to do this. We should be asking them to be, again, eyes on the street, like Jane Jacobs said. Be well, that information source for the cops that actually do walk the beat. Well, and you're going to get a lot more out of being an engaged neighborhood member 
by going out and spending that time interacting with people and looking around, not just sitting at home with your phone watching the video, you know, shaking yes. digicam video of somebody. We always a make fun of how like Facebook is such an ineffective yeah. way of generating any kind of change. It's like, oh, look at you going for racial justice by standing up by you know putting a post online. Do you really think that sharing? crime videos online with your fellow neighbors you're number one you're only going to get your other neighbors who are on that social media platform who are equally outraged and not really best able to determine what is a crime who is that person get rid of racial bias they haven't had training yeah. and by proposing this and saying that you're going to stamp it with an nypd seal of approval that they're going to mm -hmm. host it you're putting a very dangerous stamp of approval on this program that really in my opinion even even if we're assuming that that's not going to happen, even if we're assuming that, like, people aren't going to file a spate of new police reports mm -hmm. fraudulently to get access to this database, because if mm -hmm. you're saying the only way of accessing this is to file a police report, well, and it's going to be know. a huge target for hackers? Well, this is the question. It, it The only way to get your video on it is to file a police report. I don't know who gets access to it. I'm assuming... It. I'm supposed to be able to tell that, like, oh, this guy was doing this thing... Well, if it's like, public, then that's really bad. If it's, like, someone who's been vetted by the police, that makes it hard to access. If it's anyone who submitted a police report, which is what I think that he's going mm -hmm. for based on the videos okay. of him proposing it. Okay. Like, you post your video. It's kind of a share and share alike thing. You post your video, now right. you got access to a bunch of others to cross-correlate. So as long as everybody is a victim of a crime with video, everybody gets to see it. <laughs> and I don't know if you really want nothing but victims analyzing no. this problem. Because these are just the people who might be a little oversensitive about well, this. Well, and... not even that, but it also, re that, that actually creates a feedback loop that reinforces that, oh, I was a victim of my package getting stolen. Well, now I'm on this system and I see 20 other neighbors who've all, and I don't know how many then people are Then you start making like 10, it 10, 10, seem like it's whatever. a way like, bigger problem yeah. than it is. It's, it's this echo chamber that, again, people are criticizing social media like Facebook mm -hmm. for doing. And I don't think we should see our city council people tailoring this kind of very specific... Yeah echo chamber for this kind of issue. Again, bring it back to the private companies who are leaving mm -hmm. these things there in the first place and talk about a very simple solution, which again is Jane Jacobs' eye on the street. Mm. Bring back the kind of varied multi-use buildings, bars. We mm -hmm. need more, like, yeah, okay, a drunk person might pee on your stoop. I get that. That sucks. There are people that are going to barf, like, on the bumper of your parked car. But if you have <laughs> enough, like, neighborhood police officers... They'll take care of it for you. <laughs> yeah. And those bars, those are people who are out late. Mm -hmm. Restaurants, lots of different kinds of restaurants. Bayridge is great with that. I mm. think one of the unappreciated reasons why we have such a low crime rate to begin with is that 86th Street, 3rd Avenue, mm -hmm. 5th Avenue, 13th. They're active. They're very active. And we have a high proportion of restaurants compared to other neighborhoods. Mm. If you go to other neighborhoods, you don't realize yeah. that we have a really great culinary thing happening here. Actually, funny story. So the reason I live in Bay Ridge is that my grandfather grew up here and his youngest cousin, every time I've moved to New York, go to Bay Ridge, go to Bay Ridge, it's great. Um, and one of his big reasons was the restaurants are great. The nightlife is great. People are out. It's safe. It's a family situation. And that's proof that eyes on the street work. Yeah. A drunk staggering home at night might be a target of crime, yes, but most people aren't staggering home. Most mm -hmm. people are staggering home with five friends. Yeah. Yeah. And they're much less of a target, and they're also much more likely to freak out someone who's a low-level quality of life offender, mm -hmm. like someone doing graffiti, someone stealing a package. Somebody opening an unlocked car and taking a handful of change. And even if they aren't doing that, if someone's really casing your joint, like for robbery, mm -hmm. if they see that your house is near one of these commercial strips and you have a lot of people passing by, even if yeah. they're drunk, it's really hard to break into a house that way. It would be really interesting to see, actually, like if crime increases as you get away from the avenues. like People who are committing robberies, again, number one, they don't rob where they live because right, people right. might recognize them. But this is why you need to hire cops that actually yeah. are walking around, not cops that are monitoring surveillance footage. Mm -hmm. I get it. CompStat was really useful in the 90s. CompStat. CompStat was the big revolution that the NYPD said caused crime to drop, which was okay. that they were computerizing and digitizing crime records. In the they 90s. could see where there were hot spots. Right. And they could send cops there in larger numbers to make those numbers go down. Okay. And Bay Ridge under CompStat, we have 
Cops, in the numbers that CompStat suggests we have, we have a generally low crime rate. And as a result, NYPD kind of throws a moderate amount of cops toward us. Right. Um, I think we need different kind of cops. Mm -hmm. I think we have, need to have more beat cops. We need to pay them better because that job needs to be something that people want to do. Yeah, yeah. And the, the security cameras I do like are traffic mm -hmm. cams. Right. Traffic cams that capture license plates. Those are the kind of things that you sit a person there, you could just sit a camera there. Yeah. You can't make a camera interact with a community. Quaglione doesn't understand this is you don't put webcams to do the job of community policing and then put traffic cops to do the job of a security camera. <laughs> I mean, it, I would be really interested in hearing more specific thoughts about this from Quaglione, from Justin Brannan. This is a place where they could really make their stances known and where they could differentiate quite a bit. And one last point about Eyes on the Street. One of the things, ironically, that I'm seeing, and this isn't necessarily a solution or a bad thing, one of the things that's causing Eyes on the Street to kind of deteriorate, one reason why you might see an increase in package theft right. is because we're not looking out on the streets because we're yeah. on the computer and ordering things online so much. We're seeing a, a death of mom and pop are, stores. Millennials are killing <laughs> Jane Jacobs. <laughs> Honestly, <laughs> everybody who orders something online is killing Jane Jacobs. I have an Amazon pad pantry box coming in three days. Uh, <laughs> I'm so excited. <laughs> you know, we only go to our doors to pick yeah. up these packages. And it used to be that we would go out multiple times a day to get something at a corner store. So the, the hardware store that was in Saturday Night Fever is yeah. like right across from my parents' house. <laughs> and like... It's a great mom and pop. Now they're like Benjamin Moore branded paint places. Mm -hmm. And I remember when the first McDonald's came in wow. on uh, Third Avenue and we were all up in arms in this neighborhood. Now we're seeing this uptick in theft crimes. Like we were so willing to be like, ah, oh, nuts to McDonald's. I want to go to Hinch's. <laughs> but then we all started ordering these packages online. And now we're shocked that because none of us are looking outside or hanging outside our streets or going outside and... Mm -hmm encouraging mom and pops and corner barber shops and places that do keep an eye on the street. Now we're complaining that our packages are being stolen. It's ironic. Well, okay. And like, I do want to interject, like one thing I want to make really sure we're not doing, we're not victim blaming here. This isn't the fault of the person ordering the package. Oh, heck no. But I'm going to order packages till the day I die, or it can be materialized from a 3D printer in my home. And that'd be even worse for guys <laughs> on the street. But it's things like this. It's community members talking, and we should maybe just do an, a, an episode where we're sitting down on a bench somewhere and we're being eyes on the street that would be and awesome. not in a Let's little, like, a tiny uh, studio or I'm something. In. But it's not a solution, but it's ironic. It's ironic that the thing that's causing these packages to be stolen is the mm -hmm. fact that we're ordering packages at all. And we need to come up with new and sometimes old solutions to solve the problem and mm -hmm. have a proper balance. And going way far off into the digital weeds with this webcam system, it's well, not the right well, half, I think even if you do it right. It's, it's not using the technology for what the technology can do. I mean, I'm always looking for a tech solution to everything, but you have to use that wisely and you have to use it in a way that complements most effectively what you can do without the technology. And in this case, like I said, something like ResistBot, where people text their congressperson and it goes through as a fax. Why can't we yeah. have a text line set up for filing petty crime reports? Maybe just make the NYPD tip system or whatever is already there, accept social media posts yeah. directly. Or maybe Facebook or another private company should let you, kind of like how you can mark yourself as a constituent when you talk to a local mm. congressperson. Mm -hmm. What about post a video directly to your precinct? Yeah write a report. It doesn't go into a system. It doesn't go in a database. It just makes it easier to throw that data out there instead of throwing it into an echo chamber online that you suddenly realize like you're, you're not getting anywhere. Well, and I also want to just point out momentarily the irony of two left-wing um, progressives arguing against more public monitoring and arguing for private business solutions. That's yeah. how weird this proposal is. It's also how weird Bay Ridge is. Yeah, that's true. That's true. <laughs> so in summary, we don't love this program. 
We love the idea of safer streets for everyone. But we do not think that Eyes on the Street, as John Quaglione sees it, is a responsible or practical way of achieving that goal. We hope we've given you something to think about. And now, it's time for community announcements. Shout out to Maria Rosado, native of Sunset Park, now living in Texas, for sharing her song Silver Spoon from her 2015 album Brooklyn to the Bay, available on Bandcamp. Check out the rest of the album. And if you're an area musician or have ties to Bay Ridge and its surrounding neighborhoods, we'd love to feature your work too. So shoot us a link at contact at radiofreebrayridge.org. Thank you so much for joining us and taking the time to listen to a very in-depth conversation about a very specific policy that normally would get absolutely no play anywhere else. But that's kind of the point of the podcast. We're going to be hyper-local. We're going to look at the politics that affect people who live here. We want to talk to you. We want to hear from you. Our email is contact at radiofreebayridge.org. Please like, subscribe, put us in so you're when you're driving out to work or just sitting on the train. instead of getting for the R train. You can listen to a lot of national things and get very cheesed off about what's going on whether you agree or disagree with any particular political viewpoint. Or you can tune in with us and talk about what's going on in the blocks right around your house. And that's stuff you can actually do something about. That's something where you listening actually do have a major effect. The more you know about something very local, you're not just a drop in the bucket in your own neighborhood. This is local and this is where it really matters. And we would encourage you if there's anything that you've heard that you want to push to your local council people or your local community boards, 
make sure they know what you're concerned about. And we will put contact information for all your local elected officials on our website. RadioFreeBayRidge.org. Awesome. <laughs> oh, and there's the studio and, cat just and arrived. And the studio cat just broke <laughs> open the door and walked in, which means that it's time for us to sign off. Thanks so much. Thank you. Bye.